I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are each on traditional ancestral indigenous territories on, from which we're learning and working today, regardless of where we are at. And it's important to acknowledge those physical locations. I myself am joining you all today from what would be called Ashland, Wisconsin, but which is the ancestral, traditional, and, and, and contemporary home of the Lake Superior Ojibwe. And I also want to remind everyone that this is a harassment-free zone that won't be tolerated either in verbal comments or in questions that might come in to our panelists. We want this to be a welcoming and comforting environment for our exchange today. My name is Carrie Thompson. I am Director of Education and Director of International Strategies for UE, the United Electrical Radio and Machine Workers of America. And we are a union of all different kinds of workers across the United States. And we've been in partnership with many different unions as part of the North American Solidarity Project for the last few years. Today's event is called Always Essential, Frontline Workers Across Borders. This is the second in a series of joint efforts to uh, have conversations with workers on a number of different topics through online exchanges in this moment when we can't meet in person. The North American Solidarity Project is an effort to get the labor movement in North America to think about being more democratic, militant, and social uh, promote social unionism and true internationalism across our continent. And this is uh, just one thing that, that we've been doing as an organization. Many exchanges of both the leadership and rank and file level and across our education departments as well. So uh, we will probably uh, put down in the in the question and answer for you all at some point today some links to the other events that are going to be happening in this series. They're going to be going uh, from now to June 9th. The first one on racial justice happened on March 20th. It was a wonderful event. And thank you all for being here this evening and to our panelists in particular, but also for all of the participants who have joined to listen in on this conversation. And I'll just do um, one more reminder before we get into the meat of our programming. If you've joined late, to so please find the interpretation button across the bottom of your screen. Or if you're on mobile, you can find it in those ellipses, three dots for, for more, uh, more tools that Zoom has for you. And you can choose English, Spanish, or French. So hopefully everyone can participate in the language of their choice. All right, when the COVID-19 lockdowns first started about a year ago, thank you messages flowed to the thousands of frontline workers in healthcare, retail, and utilities who kept essential services available and functioning. Despite the early applause, workers have struggled through the pandemic with lack of access of personal protective equipment, cuts to pandemic pay, and rolling lockdowns that have resulted in putting them at the highest risk, as well as pressures to return to work without adequate safety plans. If for a fleeting moment, it did seem like we were all in it together, the realities of capitalism quickly caught up and pushed the heaviest burden on the working class communities throughout the pandemic. So for this panel, we wanted to gather some essential workers from across North America who have been really in the middle of this fight from a variety of sectors. And I'm really looking forward to them all being able to engage here collectively. I will allow our panelists to introduce themselves further as we get into the meat of our first quest question. But just briefly, we have Deborah Berger from National Nurses United. We have Jose Antonio Bautista Crespo from Nayarit, Mexico, and is affiliated with uh, the FATS. We have Emily Coulter from Unifor in Ontario. Jockton Jock Hill is in public utilities in Virginia Beach and is currently organizing with UE. And Krista Lee Hansen is also with Unifor out in British Columbia, Canada, and is a transit worker. So really all different kinds of workers we're gonna hear from today. 
So um, as we go through, I'll, I'll call on people to start with because it's lots of voices. And as we get further along in the discussion, if people want to pipe up and, and direct it themselves a little bit more, we can do that. Uh, but I'll start with the first question to get everyone a little bit more oriented to who all we have here. Can you tell us a little bit about your job, what it is that you do uh, since we're all in different countries and uh, not everyone's work looks the same? And what's something that changed about your work over the course of this last year? So I'm going to start with Deborah, if that's all right. Uh, good afternoon. Um, well, I'm a, a registered nurse and I work at uh, Kaiser in Santa Rosa, that's in Sonoma County, California. <clears throat> I'm uh, one of the presidents of National Nurses United and um, National Nurses was one of the founding organizations of Global Nurses United representing uh, 29 countries and over a million uh, nurses, both registered nurses and healthcare workers. In Sonoma County, um, I am in conscious sedation in gastroenterology. <clears throat> I do um, uh, procedures. I make sure the patients are comfortable while the doctor is doing uh, colonoscopies or upper endoscopies. And um, I've been a registered nurse for over 45 years. Wonderful, and thanks for joining us. I'll pass it over. Oh, did you wanna add anything about something oh, that's changed about yeah, your- Yeah, right. Well, so um, really uh, as far as change um, with the pandemic, nothing changed and everything changed. Um, our employers are still um, trying to uh, get by with doing as little as possible. Um, nurses are still having to fight to uh, get what they need for their patients. Um, and during the pandemic, we've had to fight for PPE. And uh, as of last Friday, we had 362 registered nurse deaths that we know of and over 3,000 uh, non-RN healthcare worker deaths uh, from COVID-19. So, um, and that's really not well documented. We've done what we could to um, sift through the uh, reports the, and get what we could, but nobody's actually keeping track of that. So we're, we're essential, but you know, hey, you know, if somebody dies, we're not so essential. So um, that's another part of it that's really disturbing. Yeah, indeed it is. Thanks. I'm gonna ask Antonio to go next. Can you tell us a little bit about your work, what you do and uh, how it's changed over the last year? Gracias, Cari. Buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Bueno, eh, su servidor, Secretario General del Sindicato de Trabajadores al Servicio de los Poderes del Estado y Municipios en mi estado en Nayarit. Eh, somos un sindicato de trabajadores públicos, tenemos trabajadores afiliados desde recolectores de desechos eh, en casa por casa hasta eh, trabajadoras, trabajadores eh, de, de lo que llamamos la asistencia social, ¿no? Para donde hay enfermeras como la compañera Débora, donde hay médicos, ingenieros, abogados, es decir, toda la cadena de trabajo de un gobierno estatal o municipal que eh, representamos nosotros como, como sindicato. Y en cuanto a qué ha cambiado en la, en, en la pandemia, bueno, como dice Débora, ni siquiera tenemos un, un estimado, un aproximado real de cuántas compañeras o compañeros se han contagiado o muerto, porque vaya, somos empleados públicos y no todos tenemos ni siquiera servicio de salud. Entonces, cada quien acude a la hora de un contagio donde puede, como puede, en cuanto a herramientas de trabajo, dispositivos de seguridad, vaya, no hay ni siquiera gel antibacterial en, en, en las oficinas públicas. Entonces, eh, los protocolos jamás se, se establecieron. Entonces, ¿qué cambió? Pues que prácticamente gran 
parte de los trabajadores y trabajadoras eh, que son vulnerables se tuvieron que ir a casa porque no había condiciones de mantenerlos trabajando por no tener los implementos necesarios para no contagiarse. Eh, los demás, los que tuvieron que estar eh, trabajando, el caso de, del sector eh, salud, de la seguridad pública, los de recolección de desechos, impartición de justicia, bueno, pues han seguido trabajando así como pueden, la verdad que como pueden, sin, sin equipos, sin materiales, y bueno, pues, eh, ¿qué ha cambiado? Que en el caso del sector público, pues hay áreas que no puedes cerrar, o sea, no puedes definitivamente cerrar un hospital, no puedes cerrar un centro de rehabilitación para enfermos de alcoholismo, de adicción. Entonces, pues se tiene que seguir dando la batalla en primera línea como puedas. Y en algunos casos llevar tus propios implementos, eh, hacer cooperación entre las trabajadoras y trabajadores para tener los implementos que el área necesita y poder atender al, al pueblo, al ciudadano. Entonces, eso es lo que ha cambiado eh, de, en términos generales. No hubo un caso de despidos, pero sí tenemos el caso de que nuestros sueldos, nuestras prestaciones, en un año se ha dejado de pagar el 11% de esos salarios por eh, que los gobiernos dicen no tener los mismos ingresos de, en el tema de los impuestos y que por eso no nos han podido cumplir todas nuestras prestaciones. Gracias. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, Emily, I'll pass it over to you next. So tell us a little bit about what your work is and what's changed in the last year. Uh, thank you, Carrie, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Emily Coulter. First of all, I want to say thank you for the opportunity for sharing my story yet again. Um, I'm a personal support worker. Um, for those of you who don't know what a personal support worker is, um, we're, we're the people that take care of uh, your moms and dads, your grandmas and your grandpas, and your omas and your aunties, and everything that you call them um, in long-term care. Uh, we're in the community. We're in group homes, we're in retirement homes, we're, we're everywhere, we're, we're wherever you need us, we're there. Um, so what we do, we uh, take the responsibility as a caretaker um, for residents and, and some residents or, or clients or, or home care um, will vary depend on what their needs are. And we try to fill that gap so that, um, you know, They, they continue to have that quality of care that without losing dignity or, you know, to maintain what, they, what they, they've lost. Um, some of our roles as a personal support worker is, you know, like getting them dressed, bathing, feeding. Uh, we do rehabilitation for range of motion, uh, grooming, you know, the list goes on and on for what we do to get them through their day. And, and And we also work like as a part of a team with registered nurses and, and doctors so that uh, we come up with care plans and uh, everything that they would need, as I say, to um, best take care of that resident. Those are just some of the examples that we, uh, that we are. Um, what's changed in long-term care? <laughs> Deborah, Deborah nailed it. It was just, it's everything's changed and nothing's changed. Um, Aside from my personal life going crazy, you know, with childcare and school closures and um, at work, everything's changed. Uh, we now work in PPE eight hours a day. We had to fight for the right to get that PPE and that was another struggle on its own, but now we're dealing with working in that PPE all day. Um, policy changed. Policy changed week by week, sometimes day by day, sometimes hour by hour, so the nurses, of the world will tell you like what we did yesterday isn't what we do today it wasn't what we do an hour ago we failed and we failed and we failed and we struggled and a year later looking back like we we all learned from it so you know everything's changed nothing's changed um i can just say that we weren't prepared for it back then absolutely it hit us like a brick wall it it we've seen it 
um, out there. We've seen it in the world. And we always say, okay, well, when it gets here, we're gonna we're gonna deal with it. We're gonna have it. So we had to advocate for that right, as I said, for that BP. And then that played such a role in stopping the spread. So I think the biggest change I would say um, is is that is that PPE took over. Like we all wear it. We're sick and tired of wearing masks and goggles and shields and, and gowns, but it's the biggest change within that last year. Um, the big, another change is that long-term care was suffering um, even before the pandemic with how short we are with PSWs all over, all over Canada. Um, and then we lost a lot of workers. So we were working short during that pandemic as well. So that was another big um, change is to see just how scared people were to come to work. So Yeah, that's great, Emily. And I appreciate that you mentioned your personal life as well, because that is part of what it means to be a worker, right? Is to deal with all of the challenges of life. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and call on Krista. Go ahead and, and tell us a little bit about what your work is and how it changed. So I'm Krista Lee. I am a proud member of Unifor Local 111, which means I sell my labor as a public transit bus driver. I'm a full-time transit driver. I have been for about 16 years and I drive right downtown in the city of Vancouver on the Western coast of Canada. I drive electric vehicles built by uniform members in Winnipeg. So I'm very proud of that as well. Um, so I drive a 40 foot electric bus. Um, so May 3rd last year, my bus would always have, you know, 70 people crammed as close to me as they could, you know, nose to armpit, completely packed on. And you know, over the course of my my union career, many times I had you know talked to people on the street campaigning or to the press or anything, talking about how we need more buses, we have no space, we need more buses, we have no space. Uh, the morning of March 13, 16th, we all went to work and there was no one on any of our buses. Right, that's when they they shut us down here in British Columbia. Our kids all came home on spring break. They never went back that year. By the way, it was the longest spring break ever. It lasted for four months. Um, but yeah, on that Monday, all of a sudden this bus that I'd have 70 people on, I'd have like two people on, three people on. Um, that actual few number of people only lasted a few days, but you noticed, you know, the university lines, we had no people, any of the more affluent areas where people were choosing to take transit were much less busy, but I drive by a hospital every day. Those people went to work the whole time. They're still going to work now, right? Um, the people that are coming to, you know, work in all of our, you know, downtown restaurants, you know, doing takeout, all our service workers, all our PSWs that are going from care home to care home, they're still taking our buses. So we watched the buses get busier and busier and busier. Um, so now we're not still at the levels we were a year and a couple weeks ago, but I don't have the capacity I did then either. Now I have about 40 40 people on a bus, which is, you know, full seated load, about, but about five standing people, but we're leaving people behind now, right? Because people need to work, right? People need to get to work, but there are certain people that you don't see on the bus anymore. Absolutely. Those people made the choice early on because they could, they were affluent enough. Um, they had the sorts of jobs you could do from home, which many, many, many of us don't. I don't get to drive a bus from home. Right. Um, so they, they're not on the bus right now. So that's the biggest change in the work. And uh, with the employer, the biggest change was a year ago, they wouldn't let us wear masks, right? Like we had to fight them. We had, before the pandemic started, we had some members with you know asthma issues who needed to wear them during a forest fire season and they would get disciplined for it, right? So we went from that fight to the beginning of the pandemic, they were still like, mm, we don't want you to scare the customers. Please don't wear a mask. So now that, you know, they're, mandatory, although they're not enforced in any way, shape or form. So I would say most of my customers get on wearing a mask, but there are a lot of masks that, you know, look like this or look like this. This is a popular one, right? So they, they technically they have a mask, but it's more for show than anything else. So th that's kind of been an interesting change. Just, just watching that, right? So not allowed to wear a mask. Okay. Everyone has to wear a mask. So yeah, that's one of the big changes. Thanks. That's great. Very, very illustrative of 
what the visually I think felt like for lots of us to all this to be with people all the time and then go you know by ourselves. Um, Jock, if you are able to uh, get yourself off mute and join us and tell us a little bit about what your work is and what's changed in the last year. Jock is traveling right now, so he won't be appearing on video, but we could hear him clearly earlier when we did our, our tests. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. And I'm sorry for the inconvenience. I actually just came back on vacation from vacation. So I'm in transit getting back home to the Virginia Beach. So I am a, I am an employee for the city of Virginia Beach in the state of Virginia. We, uh, I, I'm in the public utilities department, uh, sewer collection to be more specific. And what we do is everything dealing water in the city. So we replace, we repair sewer lines, lateral lines, as storm drains, like you got uh, pump stations. We are uh, everything. Just keep the water flowing. Everything. So when you flush the toilet, that's us. When you twelve in the morning or three o'clock in the morning, whatever time it may be, your sewage stops up, your shower water backs up. Whatever it is, that's us. We around the clock now. Stops twenty four hour operation. A lot of us work ten hour shifts. Some twelve. Some eight. You know, but it's nonstop. It's always on call, on duty. Stand by. Over time, you take your pick. There's always work to be done. The city is everywhere. We absolutely keep the city moving. Uh, public utilities, to be specific, and public works. Those are two very strong departments. And for the city of Virginia Beach, you know, uh, the city of Virginia Beach itself is a tourist location. So there is various, a lot of money. A lot of revenue occurred here. It's, it's, it's always booming. It's never a dull moment, especially work-wise. Um, and like, okay, so as far as what has changed the most in a year, that's kind of a tricky question. You got, I would probably say our workload. The workload has definitely, definitely increased. We got a lot of employees gone. That have that have, that have left in the last year. Uh, a lot of employees have gotten sick due to COVID. Just uh, the way management has handled the COVID situation, like they were so late, so late to the party as far as preparation, and it was almost like they didn't believe the wave was coming. Like before it hit, we had we gave them all the warning, and like a lot of a lot of guys in the in my department in the city in general, we. Specifically, I remember telling management, like, yo, I, I'm not sure if y'all understand how serious this is, but we need to, we need masks. Like we, we hadn't gotten masks. We were already a month into a month strong into the pandemic by the time the city gave us, provided us with masks, proper, proper masks. And even when they gave us masks, the N95 masks, we may have gotten one or two of those. And that was it, you know, and especially in my line of work, we're outside in the open, we're in public, we we're digging holes sometimes 15, 17 feet deep in the city streets. We can't wear masks like every day, the same mask every day. We need fresh supply of masks. Like we have to, these things need to be readily available, hand sanitizer. We need all them things. Just like we have our screwdrivers and our drills when we go out to work, we need, these things have become priority. They drop the ball on just handling the PPE all as a whole, man, it's, it's really crazy. Uh, what else has changed? I'll say the morale. With the morale all through the, the building, it's gone way down. You already said, it's a lot of people leaving, people finding other work, similar jobs, other employment, because it doesn't seem like our, empl our employer has want to get a grip on just handling the issue at hand they almost want to avoid it it's like they wait for the government as a whole to make a decision and then they kind of take that information and process it and then they'll give it make up some in-house rules and then to pro then you know disperse the information to us that way they're just way behind the ball on management itself like the management is behind the ball on management it's this poor management i like to say i like to call it but uh, we've been definitely 
make trying to make the best of it. We bring our own mask. We we've resulted to buying our own masks, hand sanitizer. I will say they keep like disinfected light saws, but that again, that was weeks, weeks, weeks into the pandemic when we got that, you know, our job with our job, we're always, we drive trucks. We have to, we're provided, we are required to get CDL licenses. So we drive dump trucks, excavators, all sorts of machinery. And, you know, not always are you driving the same truck. The truck you're driving today with your crew, you might, you, your crew may be four or five, you may have a four or five man crew today. Tomorrow you may have a three man crew. The next day you may have a six man crew. So just, that's what I mean, as far as Lysol, that's when these things come into play because you got people jumping in and out of trucks. You, you don't, you know, you got off work at five o'clock yesterday, but you don't know who worked that night shift and who got in your truck. Was that, po was that person tested? Have they, like the, our job is not taking temperatures when we get to work and never have, not one time. It's just certain, certain things. I think that they should have been on the, you know, on the money with way ahead of the game they just have it and it's kind of definitely taking a toll on the workplace definitely definitely thanks jack yeah that sounds like a, a pretty good summary there and all all of you have these very important tasks that our communities would not be able to function with without those the work that you are doing. And I think we already have started to hear some common threads of increased workload, right? Because of, you know, people who can't come to work without safety conditions or who are themselves sick and they aren't there. And that then the employer hasn't done enough to get other people in to, to fill those workplace shortages that you are all experiencing. I, I think Let's, I'd like to add also that you know, in the United States, our employers got billions, billions of dollars to provide care uh, for COVID patients, to buy equipment, to buy supplies. And um, they kept it under lock and key. I can totally relate to what Jock was saying because uh, in healthcare, in healthcare, they were doing the exact same thing. They were locking up masks, they were rationed out, they were locked up in the manager's rooms. And when nurses bought their own masks at the very beginning, when they were told, don't scare the patients, just like uh, Krista said, um, we bought our own masks and nurses were disciplined and fired. We had to uh, fight like crazy to get the nurses reinstated and to get people to listen. And the equipment is still locked up and hospitals still are not following all of the basics of infection control. So I can relate exactly to what Jock is saying because it's happening in healthcare and it's really a criminal um, that we don't have adequate supplies and um, we were asked to wear decontaminated uh, masks, which were essentially uh, poisoned masks because of the chemicals they used. So it was aggravating nurses' uh, asthma and other respiratory illnesses. So um, it is really, really upsetting. I'd, I'd like to add to that too, Carrie, if I can. Um, uh, we're going through the same thing here. We still have long-term care homes that are still struggling for PPE. Um, they're under lock and key. You couldn't get an N95 anywhere. Um, they were like, "Oh, you don't need it. You don't need it. It's not a droplet. For, you know, they're not coughing at you. You're gonna, you're gonna just have a regular mask." But I remember at um, at uh, my my workplace is that we went out. And we got our own. And then we were reprimanded as a team to just be like, you're going to scare the residents. They're not going to know who you are. And as I said, we advocated for that over and over and over. And that's still happening today. It's still happening today. PPE was the reason why we didn't stop the spread, but we slowed down the spread tremendously. So to hear other people going through the same thing as Canada and long-term care and retirement homes and, and public... Uh, sector is going through the same thing. It's shameful. It's just shameful. And I, and I empathize with everyone 
who's in the same position that we are here in Canada. Thank you. Yeah, any others want to chime in on this this crisis of uh, PPE? I think you've all addressed it a little bit, but and this bring up anything else anybody wants to chime in on there? Just like the rest of them, we're still waiting for ours. Um, I, I, I did get these nice cloth masks from my employer, which are two layers, not the recommended three layers. And, and that's what we get, right? We got two of these. So make sure you wash them every single day. Um, we did eventually get, I think, three liters total so far of hand sanitizer, though. So I have to say they're on top of it for the hand sanitizer. And I'm so glad that hand sanitizer smells better now. I don't know for the rest of you, but right early in the pandemic, it was all made by breweries or distilleries. So if you are a public transit worker and your hand sanitizer smells like whiskey, you're going to get a lot of phone calls. So we did actually have that problem. We had one batch that smelled like tequila, actually. And so the bus drivers were cleaning our hands and then people were getting on the bus smells like tequila in here and calling in. So I'm just glad that hand sanitizer smells like hand sanitizer again. Yeah, it's good to find those moments of levity in this ridiculous crisis, but I know we've had that here as well. Antonio, yeah, go ahead. Okay, gracias. Bueno, lo, lo que decía eh, Krista, Débora, Emily, En el caso de nosotros, es en, al, en, algunos, en algunas áreas solamente, un cubrebocas nos han dado en un año. El cubrebocas más simple, más sencillo que puedan eh, comprar en una, en una farmacia. Pero lo peor fue eh, a final del año 2020, cuando en otro estado de México hubo unas inundaciones por las lluvias. Entonces, cada estado, cada gobierno, le pidió a la población que apoyara con eh, alimentos, con víveres, con gel antibacterial, con cubrebocas, etc. Lo que pasó aquí en mi estado fue que gran parte de esos víveres que las personas, a pesar de la pandemia, estaban donando para nuestros hermanos de otro estado, se los quedó el gobierno. Y esos víveres, eh, esos cubrebocas, ese gel antibacterial, es el que ha estado repartiendo en algunas áreas para los trabajadores o para quien va por algún servicio. Eso es algo criminal. No sé si, si en sus países también haya ocurrido algo parecido, pero aquí es increíble que no nada más este, no cumplas con tu responsabilidad, sino que prácticamente eh, robes lo que el pueblo está otorgando para que tú como gobierno vayas y ayudes a tus hermanos de otros estados que están en una desgracia con el agua literal hasta el cuello por las inundaciones y que ellos lo tomen eh, por ejemplo un, un bote de gel digamos de este tamaño y que cuando ya va la mitad le pongan más agua y nada más lo mezclen y ese es el gel que se está usando entonces no cumple no cumple con ninguna eh, normatividad y el caso de eh, los cubrebocas esos muy delgados estoy hablando de áreas del gobierno federal incluso de atención médica, como el caso de Débora en hospitales que están atendiendo enfermos COVID y solo les dieron un cubrebocas al inicio de la pandemia y es fecha que no les, que no les otorgan más nada. En el caso de los trabajadores de la recolección de la basura, no tienen guantes de ningún tipo. Entonces, prácticamente con las manos, este, como toman las bolsas de basura, aquí es manual, aquí las dejas afuera de tu casa y las tomas, las subes al camión Entonces, ¿qué se le pedía al ciudadano? Que ellos limpiaran las bolsas, ya que las tuvieran con la basura dentro, les pusieran ahí eh, cloro, gel, alcohol, algo, para que nuestros compañeros pues, no, se, no se contagiaran a la hora de, de tomar esas bolsas. Gracias. Wow, wow, that is really deplorable to hear. Let's think about this kind of same question from a slightly different angle. Did you all hear any of that public praise? Were you called a hero or given some public recognition for working during the pandemic? And how did that resonate with you and your coworkers 
and 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 how did it also maybe clash with the reality of what you were really experiencing? We'll we'll mix up the order a little bit. Um, Emily, can you can you go first this time? Sure. Um, so being called essential, being called heroes, being called angels of long term care and and frontline workers, and being like at the forefront of this pandemic was great. We were finally being recognized that we couldn't stay home. We can't. As I say, someone is depending on us to show up to work. Um, we are essential. Do we see ourselves as heroes? No, we show up for work. We've been doing this for how many years? Um, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've never once considered myself as a hero. I, I went to work even though I was afraid. I was afraid of catching it. I did catch it actually at work. Um, I was afraid of bringing it home to my family. I was afraid of what it would do to my body was is it what was inside like when when it was inside of me. So being called a hero when you feel like you're not, even though people see you as and and you recognize that you can see why they call you a hero because you have to go to work during this pandemic. You have to work. There's no there's no way you can bring your work home. Um, what we do is essential, absolutely. And I would call my coworkers heroes because they were my heroes. They are the ones that got me through it. I'm telling you right now, if it wasn't for my coworkers, I would probably be a absolute mess. And I am, I'm not, I'm still trying to figure it out. But you don't feel like a hero when you feel like you're failing. And what I mean by that is, one death is too many. When you can't do anything to save, I'm sure Deborah can attest to that. So if you, when you lose one, you're like, oh my God, could I've been there? What could I have done? Um, and the underlying conditions are what contributed to them passing away from COVID. There's nothing that you did. It's nothing that you could have prevented. It's nothing that you could have changed that would have changed the outcome. So to be called a hero, it's nice, it's great, but I don't feel that way because I've lost many. We've been called hero essential and everything else in between by all levels of government. All levels, our community was amazing. There was so much amazing support where they put up flags and banners that said hero works here. Unifor was amazing at rallies and they were there for us and you know to just lift our spirits and make us feel like what you're doing matters. And, and it did, it all helped. It all solidified at the end. And, and you did say, okay, yes, I did, I did make a difference in someone's life today. And I put all my personal fears aside and, and you know, all your doubts and, and whatnot. So um, hero, I would call everybody else that except myself. So I call all my coworkers, I call all my peers, I call all, my fellow um, workers out there like Krista and Jose and, and Jock and Deborah, I call you all heroes because you're there outside with me. You're, you're fighting this fight. So you're my heroes to me personally and myself. If I lost one, I've lost one too many. So thank you for all the praise to the community and all, all the governments and whatnot, but uh, that's just my personal feeling. Everybody else, um, we're, we're essential. We're just, we show up for work. This is our job. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Thanks, Emily. How about Deborah? Do you want to get in on this question? Were you, were you called a hero? Did that make you, how did that make you feel or did it clash well, with reality? Um, yes, it did clash with reality. Um, the definition of a hero is a person who's admired or idealized for courage, uh, outstanding achievements or noble qualities. And uh, our employers called us heroes all the time, but completely disregarded uh, our experience, our expertise when we told them we needed more staff, more uh, PPE. Um, and the wins that we had, the stuff that we got was because of our union 
and the work that they did throughout this pandemic, they were heroes too. They didn't stop. They supported the nurses and really made sure that we had the tools to fight back and, and protected us when we spoke out, uh, when managers tried to fire nurses. Um, nurses never got the pandemic pay. So, you know, yeah, we're heroes, but it felt like we were expendable. Um, and then uh, when you look at the definition of a warrior, um, that's somebody who's uh, brave and experienced and fights right. Uh, so I think that uh, more accurately, um, we're, we're really uh, warriors. Um, that actually more accurately fits the, the work that we do every single day. We're fighting not only for our safety and our patient safety, but our, for our communities. When you think about the work that uh, people that are essential are doing from Krista, who's getting people to work safely and, and hopefully helpful um, and uh, making sure that they're on time, you know, so that they can go to work. And then Jock, who's making sure that we have clean water, that our, our sewage system works. They're indispensable, but it breaks my heart to hear that nobody was given um, the, the support or tools they needed, even though the federal government in the United States is the richest um, country in the world, and they treated the workers um, so badly and without regard. It, you know, I know it was coming from people's hearts, but they honestly had no idea how badly all of our workers were treated. And it really made me angry um, that um, there was sort of a double speak. You know, they would say, oh, we appreciate the work. Here's uh, a pizza today, but we, we didn't want pizza. We wanted masks. We wanted gloves. We wanted gowns. Who gave a shit about pizza? And so, the, I, so yeah, it made me angry and Thank frustrated. You. Yeah, I bet. Thank you. Yes. Krista, how about you? Did you guys hear some of that? Yes. Get you. People had to still get to work. You were doing that work. What did they tell you and, and how did that make you feel? just want to open with Emily you are a hero <laughs> I think you need to hear it from someone else sometimes so thank you, thank you uh, um yeah we did um I have a child in elementary school and one of the things they did was they made signs right thank you to you know all these workers it was part of their homeschooling right when they when all the kids were supposed to be schooling when we had them all at home and we were all going to work Anyway, so they made these thank you signs and a bunch of the kids had bus drivers on them. You know, they had grocery store workers and personal support workers and nurses and definitely city workers. And yeah, some of them had bus drivers on them. And, you know, we heard that and we heard, you know, how great it was that we were going to work and all of these sorts of things. While we saw everyone else at home learning how to bake bread and all of these other things. So many people I know learned how to make bread. But, you know, we got through this and part of it was we were promised, you know, you are frontline workers, you're essential. Although I always push back against the word essential as a union worker, because sometimes that takes away our right to strike, right? We are critical workers driving essential workers to work. That's what we told everyone. Um, but yeah, so we heard all that. We knew, you know, we had to go to work, but there were some hopes, you know, maybe because we're frontline workers, we'll get in line for the vaccine you know, as a frontline worker, right? So our province in Canada, each province has rolled it out a little differently. Here, originally, when they put out their first one, beginning of this year, yep, in March, we're gonna put all those frontline workers are gonna be on that list. And then in February, they put out a new list that said, no, we're just gonna go through the whole province by age. No one's on that list. We're just gonna start at the top and work our way down. No one's on the list. So I cried all of that weekend, right? Just, you know, that was kind of like the one 
the one little hope at the end after, you know, not learning how to make sourdough, I was going to get my vaccine maybe. Um, but then they changed them again. So we got some more vaccines approved in Canada. So they changed them again. So March 18th is International Transit Worker Appreciation Day. So on March 18th, the province put out a new schedule with a bunch of frontline workers on it that were going to start getting approved and transit workers weren't on the list. Um, I don't want to take away from anyone else that is on the list. All of those workers do great jobs, but it was kind of a slap in the face for us, right? Like, you need to come to work, you need to do all of this. Like, and I know some of you will have these great stories too. When I come home from work, my shoes stay out there. All of my work clothes go into a bucket. That bucket goes right into the laundry, right? Like, we don't want to get our family sick. All of us that have been working full time through this with, you know, our... PPE that's locked in someone else's closet or our PPE like jock that we've had to reuse 27 times, right? So we don't want to get them sick. So we're doing all of this stuff every day and it weighs on you and it is stress. And then just to be slapped in the face and said, yeah, you're not that kind of frontline worker, right? You don't really count enough for a vaccine, but you know, maybe, maybe next time, maybe next time. So yeah. That, like keep that, coming to work, of course. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Keep coming to work. We we definitely need to get, you know, everyone to work. I actually drive by a COVID testing site. Do you know how people get to COVID testing when they don't own a car? They take my bus and they come up to me with their address in my face and their mask down here, like I said, and go, do you go here? Yes, I go there. I will tell you when we get there, right? Please put your mask on. <laughs> Please put your, it goes over your nose, but yeah. I just wanted to say, Krista, that you're essential, but, you know, there's that but dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. So you're essential, but your wages don't go up. You don't qualify for the pandemic pay. You're essential, but here's two masks. You know, you're essential, but there's always that giant but out there. So kudos to the job that you do. I mean, we couldn't do it without you. So thank you. Yeah, how about Jack? How about down in Virginia Beach? Did you get some extra kudos and thank yous from folks? How did that make you feel? And how did that contrast with the reality of your work? Yeah, it's uh, the residents, uh, just the community as a whole, they'll, they, they are quick to let you know that they are appreciative. They, I mean, they stop traffic, man. They. They'll, they come out of their houses. I, we work majority of the time as residential. We do a lot of commercial work, like restaurants and stuff. So we're that's like when we're in intersections, like major highway, like not highways, but like just the busiest of intersections. But uh, yeah, the residents, man, they come out of their houses. You can just from wherever we are, you can just look up the street. Like there's just kids sitting in their windows. They're in the front yards. They'll come out as close as they can get to the hole, man, and just want to watch what their parents, they're watching the dump trucks. They like, you know, the kids, they love the machinery. They love the noise. They want to, everybody wants to see what the noise is. They want to know what, the, what kind of work their neighbor, everybody's nosy, they want to know what kind of work their neighbor's getting done. Uh, they're going to give us a whole historical history on the house, the street, and when the house was built. It's real, like, everybody, they are real appreciative, and they let us know, like, even down to or even up to, you know, our crew leaders and our UMSs, which is like our supervisor. Oh, we have a crew, there's a leader of that crew, and then that leader has a boss. So I just leave it like that. Everybody, the whole little tree is, they let us know that we are, they are appreciative of our work and our due diligence. But like, it was like uh, Emily said, when the essential, and when it first hit and they let you know, like, oh yeah, you're essential workers. Like, okay, you have this responsibility, this, you have you're obligated. I was like, okay, I'm obligated. But then you realize, like, all oh, you don't you don't know what comes with that, and you would. The expectation is that okay, well, if I'm this and I have to show up and do this, then surely there's going to be, you know, adequate protection, adequate, you know, pay, adequate whatever. My job was already doing sewer collection, public utilities. That should already have hazardous pay prior to COVID, that's on, COVID just came about. Public utilities, people, but these people have been working in sewer in the ground 
would have without having to pay for it. How that is crazy to me. But okay, you tack on COVID. On top of that, we are in the community working with close, you know, close range with various people. It makes no sense. It makes it makes no sense. But as far as being a hero, yeah, we get that, man. Hell of times throughout the week, just sprinkle it all throughout the week. It's there. And I, that I know that has nothing to do with the fact that I have a Spider-Man mask and I painted Spider-Man all over my hard hat. It's nothing to do with that. They let us know that, you know, they buy us pizza. We work overtime. We're out all night, like 16 hour shifts. You know, it, they're out there. They bring us pizza. They bring us donuts. Like, they are very much aware that we are busting our ass all sorts of hours. They find out, don't let a resident, don't let a community, don't let the community come out and then they get to talking and they find out that, you know, how many hours we worked and we didn't get no lunch or there's no hazardous pay, they will go off. And it's just like, you know, there's another one. If only you knew, everybody thinks, oh, you work for the cities. You must be great. You must be, you must have this. Oh, it must be so great. It's like, it's kind of a myth, you know, it's kind of a myth, but you do feel like a hero because you understand that what comes along with the work. Like if we, it's just like fire department. If the fire, if there was no fire department tomorrow, they should say, you know what? Thursday and Friday, we're not, don't call us. It's like, whoa, we have to pray no fire show up. Or if the police just say, you know what? Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, don't call us. They are essential. They don't have that choice. You know, we have to, we don't have that choice. We work through the hurricanes. We work through everything. Like we, there hasn't been a day off since COVID. We're at work every day, every day. Yeah, that, that not even being able to take a day off, that takes its own toll uh, in addition to the fears about the virus itself. Definitely the exhaustion builds up, yeah. Um, Antonio, how about you? What kinds of language were folks using in, in Mexico? Did they call you a hero? What did they say? Bueno, acá el sector salud, lo que tiene que ver con la medicina, enfermeras, médicos, sobre todo esos dos empleos, sí, se les ha llamado héroes. Se les ha eh, dicho en los hospitales que son héroes. Y lo que ha dicho los trabajadores de, de la salud es, es que no tenemos necesidad de ser héroes, primero, si la gente se cuidara más y si tuviéramos todas las medidas de protección al alcance de la mano. Eso es lo que han dicho ellos. Ahora, ¿qué ha pasado con los gobiernos? Los gobiernos, en el mejor de los casos, van al hospital, por ejemplo, donde trabaja Débora o donde trabaja Emily, y ponen una placa donde dice, reconocemos a las y los trabajadores por su esfuerzo durante la lucha. Y es todo. Se toman la foto, nuestros gobiernos, nuestros políticos, y se van. Eh, recordemos que aquí en México el, la capacidad eh, económica de la población es todavía más baja. Entonces, sí con mucho esfuerzo, eh, lo que comentaba eh, yo, te, sí la gente te da ese saludo, ese abrazo, ese apapacho, pero en el tema de que te apoyen con algo, sí es muy complicado. Recordemos que también eh, la tasa de desempleo se fue a las nubes, por el tema de la pandemia. Muchos eh, negocios, empresas cerraron, entonces la gente está sin trabajo. Entonces, esa situación agravó aún más la, 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 la ya de por sí este, difícil economía. Entonces, sí se llama a los trabajadores del sector salud, se les llama héroes, pero ellos eh, han hecho esta campaña mejor, decir, eh, me apoyas cuidándome, me apoyas eh, siguiendo las, lo, las medidas de sanidad esenciales y básicas. ¿Por qué? Porque por más de que yo fuera un héroe, y así lo dicen, que no lo soy, yo no te puedo salvar la vida si ya llegas en unas condiciones tan mal, con las cuales, aparte, si yo no tengo ningún cubrebocas, mucho menos voy a tener un tubo para poderte entubar y conectarte a una máquina que te dé oxígeno a un tanque con el que no cuento. Entonces, sí se ha dicho y se le sigue llamando así al sector salud, eh, héroes. Y también hay otra lucha, la lucha eh, 
donde los médicos y enfermeras dicen, no nada más somos nosotros, también está el personal de limpieza, el personal camillero, eh, los choferes de ambulancia, los paramédicos, o sea, todo lo que conlleva un hospital, incluso eh, las áreas administrativas. Entonces, cuando se empieza ya a vacunar a estos trabajadores eh, de primera línea, eh, lo curioso es que en muchos hospitales se ha vacunado a gente que incluso está en su casa, o sea, pertenecen al sector salud, pero por ser vulnerables los mandaron a casa y los que están laborando no los vacunan que porque no tienen todavía una edad avanzada. Entonces, eso también ha venido a ser una contradicción, porque si por un lado eres héroe, lo que comentaban ustedes, ¿por qué por otro lado me discriminas prácticamente a la hora de este el tema de las vacunas? Y esto también ha pasado con eh, los hospitales del sector privado. O sea, las vacunas solamente las distribuye el gobierno y son para los hospitales del gobierno en las condiciones que les comentaba. Entonces, la primera línea de atención de médicos, enfermeras y todo lo que conlleva el hospital del sector eh, privado no tiene ahorita forma en todo México de obtener una sola vacuna. Entonces, sí son contradicciones muy, muy, muy fuertes que se, están, que se están dando porque una cosa es el decir y la otra cosa es el hacer. En cuanto a los empleados del sector eh, público, eh, quitando la parte de hospitales, eh, como decía yo, pues sí, eh, eh, lo primero que nos dijeron los gobiernos fue, ustedes tienen la responsabilidad para con el pueblo. Ustedes tienen que hacer como trabajadores que los gobiernos sigan funcionando. Ok, sí entendemos esa parte que tenemos una responsabilidad, pero ¿hasta dónde nuestra responsabilidad, nuestro esfuerzo va a dar con las nulas herramientas que tenemos? O sea, no es posible eh, que, que aquí, por ejemplo, en la ciudad donde yo vivo, seamos medio millón de habitantes, nada más en la capital, y a veces tengamos solamente cinco o seis camiones para que recolecten los desechos. Es, es imposible, eh, ni trabajando las 24 horas lo podemos realizar de manera adecuada. Entonces, o sea, de eso estamos hablando, ¿no? Eh, el día de hoy, por ejemplo, ese más de medio millón de habitantes no tiene agua potable en sus casas por una deuda que tiene el gobierno con la compañía de energía eléctrica y la compañía de energía cortó el suministro eléctrico a los pozos de agua, entonces más de medio millón de habitantes está sin agua potable. Y esto ha sido repetitivo en la, durante este año de la pandemia, ¿no? O sea, la falta de recursos en los gobiernos. Y bueno, pues así, ¿cuál héroe va a subsistir? O sea, ¿cuál héroe va, va a ser? Y, y es lo mismo, estos compañeros del sector eh, salud eh, insisten, no somos héroes, hacemos nuestro trabajo para el que eh, estudiamos, para el que juramos incluso eh, hacerlo y defender la vida, pero eh, pues también necesitamos ser escuchados, que nos ayuden y pues están trabajando como pueden. Yo les digo, a algunos ya se les vacunó, a otros incluso se les pasó su segunda dosis de vacuna porque pues no llegaron a tiempo esas vacunas. Pero de que son héroes, sí, considérense héroes, por favor. Gracias. Wow, really getting a sense, Antonio, of the way our crises compound upon each other there, right? I mean, if you don't have clean drinking water, that's only going to make a public health crisis worse, right? If, and if we aren't fully supporting our, the, the services that everyone needs to stay healthy, then we are, we are going to unfortunately see just more and more of these uh, pandemics, unfortunately. Uh, let's turn to thinking about what you all did in your union work to try to make things better. And, and uh, I'll frame this question around, did you teach your employers some lessons during the course of this pandemic? Do you think they learned anything, not so much from you know, our public health officials, but maybe more from uh, the workers themselves speaking up and, and demanding changes that they needed? Um, have they learned their lessons or do you have to keep doing some more work to, to drive those points home? 
uh, let's see, who would like to start on this one? How about, how about Krista? How, what have you guys been doing out in Vancouver? Um, I'm not sure I could say they learned their lessons. Um, to be fair, there was a very brief period of time, like maybe the first week or two, I was in the union office all of the time those weeks where the employer would actually come to us every day and go, I have this idea. Can we try this? I have this idea. Can we try this? Like it kind of took them by surprise. You know, they were shocked. So there was a, a brief window when, you know, we all tried to do everything we possibly could, but, you know, after, you know, weeks and months and now a year of, you know, not being able to source whatever PPE we needed or, you know, any of those other things, I think maybe the, the, the lesson was lost, but there, there was that window and, you know, I give credit where credit is due for a few days, a couple people tried. Um, as far as the union works, um, I think there were a lot of members that actually were empowered in a way um, due to this because they had ideas for something, right? Like, I think if we do this, it'll be safer. I think we can modify this and it'll be safer, right? Like you've seen pictures of bus drivers. We have shower curtains, right? Beside us in some of our coaches. Some of us have plexi shields. Some buses, we still have shower curtains, right? And there were different ways to do that. And um, we had bungee cords for a while, keeping people behind a line so that they were far enough behind us. And that started because some drivers brought some bungee cords and eventually the employer gave us bungee cords. <laughs> um, so I do think there were some members that, you know, weren't, weren't activists before, right? Maybe didn't find that thing that was theirs and realized that not dying of a pandemic was their thing that they needed to get involved in the union. So, I mean, we definitely, we have gained some, some active members, some members that felt empowered to, you know, maybe make some change or felt angry enough about the change that wasn't happening. Like Emily said, I think lots of people come to union activism through anger. We talked about this earlier, right? A lot of people get in trouble with the boss or, you know, they're upset that something isn't right. A lot of us come to it that way. And we definitely had members that came to it that way in this last year. So, I mean, that is a positive, right? More engaged yeah. membership is always good for us. That's right. Yeah. Maybe some folks took use of a health and safety committee that had been negotiated, but never used or something like that. Um, Antonio, let's go to you on this question. What were what were some of the ways that bosses learned or didn't learn their lessons? How did you guys teach them a lesson through your union work? Sí, bueno, gracias, Cari. Eh, bueno, yo creo que no aprendieron las lecciones eh, en primero porque esto ha ha seguido. Eh, recordemos que en el sector público, sobre todo acá, los jefes viven mucho de su imagen. ¿No? Se viven de la imagen más ahora que ya pueden eh, ser reelectos en, en los puestos. Entonces, al final, la mayoría se cerró en no hay recursos, no podemos hacer nada. Y con esto vino una autoadecuación de protocolos y cambios por parte de los propios trabajadores. Y ahí entra el sindicato, ¿no? El sindicato es con, con la información que el, que el propio sector salud emitió las recomendaciones que hubo al respecto de los protocolos, se los pasamos nosotros a los trabajadores y entre sindicato y trabajadores tratamos de adecuar eh, las áreas, o sea, lo que se pudo hacer, vaya, eh, adecuar una entrada exclusiva, eh, la salida, adecuar los flujos de cómo las personas tenían que ser eh, atendidas, los procesos y demás, porque en la mayoría, insisto, de los casos, los jefes dijeron, no puedo hacer nada, eh, no, no tengo con qué. Y en cuanto a las comisiones de seguridad e eh, higiene, así se llaman acá. Aquí en mi estado, solamente una oficina pública tiene comisión de seguridad e higiene. Una. Y miren que son cientos de oficinas. Entonces, solo una eh, se logró por parte igual de, de los sindicatos que fuera firmada en diciembre pasado. Apenas este mes tuvimos la primera visita a las áreas, pero este, pues todo lo demás ha sido, eh, como les digo, a través de las y los trabajadores, eh, muchos de ellos eh, del sector eh, salud, que propiamente también nosotros hemos consultado para este tema de, de la pandemia. Entonces, el sindicato ha sido ese facilitador o en algunos casos, pues prácticamente autoridad, o sea, prácticamente el sindicato llega 
y junto con los trabajadores imponemos algunas cosas y al patrón no le queda de otra más que decir, ah, ok, eh, pues está bien, hágalo como ustedes puedan o como ustedes eh, quieran. ¿eh? Entonces, este, ¿por qué? Porque también hay que decirlo, en el próximo mes de septiembre ya hay un cambio de gobierno en, los, en varios estados del país, en muchos municipios. Entonces, les digo, los políticos están pensando en cambiar de puesto o en prácticamente ya terminar su administración y ya dejar los problemas. Aquí el asunto es que los trabajadores y trabajadoras nos quedamos a recibir a los siguientes administradores y a seguir atendiendo al ciudadano. Entonces, este, yo creo que ahí fue donde es, es, es importante que lo, el sindicato, los sindicatos estemos apoyando a nuestras compañeras y compañeros y pues hasta cierto punto haciendo una función de jefes donde nosotros mismos pues establezcamos en la medida de las posibilidades eh, esos protocolos y esos cambios que tiene que haber. Excellent. Yes. I mean, we know what we need, right? As the workers actually doing the job for sure. Yeah. Um, Jack, how about you? Have, have you been able to teach your employer some lessons there in Virginia Beach? Have they learned them yet? They are currently learning. They are currently having lessons on mistreatment and uh, listening to gripes of their employees. They, this, I'll say this, they, they have learned that they have a different breed of employees in, in their building at the current moment. Um, the, the selective employees they chose to hire in the last year year and a half since I've been there just about over two years and they they have learned that they have a different type of of a different batch this time around they are we are more vocal we uh we don't just lay down and just take anything things that don't make sense are going to get questioned and they're not just going to get questioned they're going to be expect answers are going to be expected like these aren't rocket science questions we're asking so they're just they're learning that they're going to have to deal with face these issues and facing one way or another like however you're going to handle it because when we're raising these questions when we talk about or when you have situations like uh waste management had it went on strike as uh late late last year in the virginia beach whole department went on strike and you got these are pent up these are pent up problems that were never never dealt with you got guys that have been there 30 40 years and they've never had never went on strike they've never questioned this and that and when they did question whatever answer they got was what the answer they settled for so now you got those same guys who've been there 30 40 years they're mixed in with the crowd the 22 year olds they're mixed in with the 27 year olds you know the 35 year olds the guys who haven't who don't have so much to lose or really just came up different we search and we we ask questions we want answers so now you got to deal with it now you got to when they, when you mishandle uh take covid for instance and you're not on you're not on the ball with that it's not okay that you're not on the ball with it and you just made up for it seven months later no we want to know what actually we want compensation you know you got to correct these wrongs it's just like it's, you're learning this is going to be a hard long lesson and i understand that you know this isn't the first time they heard of a union they've heard of unionizing this isn't this isn't the first time this isn't this won't be a walk in the park for us either, but at the same time, you will learn, you're learning that, okay, yeah, we're, you got fighters here. You know, just lay down and take anything. We need answers. We need compensation. We need hazard pay. We need, it's a lot of stuff, a lot. I don't know how you made it this far. It's horrendous. They're, they're learning. They're learning. We got a lot of employees going just in the last two weeks, you know? This last two weeks it's it's happening fast they saw it coming they saw they saw the snowball it's happening it's, now you're here you got to deal with it so the the employer is having to deal with it absolutely and so you said one department went on strike how long was the strike oh uh, so what they did was they all showed up they all showed up to work and they just refused to go out that day and this is waste management this is 
trash collection, you know, if they don't go out, just like I said, if the police don't show up one day, they just pick a day and say, we're not going, what happens? Virginia Beach is a tourist attraction, like year round. Like, yeah, we have peak season, but it's high standard that, you know, certain, especially certain areas where all the money revenue is really being collected. That's high priority. And if those waste management say they're not going out, now you have to deal with the, the problems that the questions they brought to you last month that you just pushed aside, you know, stuff under the rug, pushed on the corner of your desk. You wasn't interested in it. Now you're looking, trying to make sure you got all those papers together. You want those receipts because you need these, you need that trash picked up tomorrow. And you got people out spending millions of dollars every day. This is nonstop. It don't slow down. So you got to, now you want to talk. Now you want to have the conversation. You're learning. You know, they're, they have, this is a lesson that they're learning and this, they're learning to deal with it from the directors on down. It's, it's hitting them hard. We have some directors that have already resigned. You know, it's happening. Yeah. It's happening yeah. in, in real learning time. Learning about your power, right? It's That's happening in important. real time. Yeah, great, thanks. Uh, Deborah. How, how about for nurses and, and your hospital in particular? What lessons are you teaching so, your boss? Well, uh, looking back over this last year uh, in our union, uh, I'm pretty confident we've taught both the hospital employers and uh, the politicians that, um, uh, and they've learned some lessons from us. <clears throat> um, as I've mentioned, every win that we've had, every um, struggle that we've taken on, no matter how big or small, was a result of our constant fight. Um, <clears throat> we've held three national days of action drawing attention to our fight and, <coughs> excuse me, the most recent action was demanding that the hospital industry put patients first and our, and our communities. And, and that was on um, January 27th. And we had thousands of nurses all over the country uh, at least 200 hospitals in the U.S. that uh, participated. Um, we've also held close to 3,000 uh, actions demanding um, uh, the highest level of protections for nurses and healthcare workers uh, that did result in improving uh, the working conditions across the country. And um, Right now, uh, we've organized uh, up to 3,000 new RNs in NNU because they saw that our union was a voice and protected them so that they could speak up. Um, and we're now in the midst of an election in Maine for 2,000 registered nurses. Um, and that's because uh, nurses have found their voice and they found that speaking up gets action. <clears throat> In California, we passed legislation requiring hospitals to uh, stock uh, and maintain a three month supply of N95 respirators, gowns and other PPE. And uh, we in California have the only uh, ratios nationally at this point. And um, our governor did the unthinkable. No other politician actually ever contemplated relaxing ratios. And he did that. He allowed a process for waivers in our ratio bill. We fought back because the employer was talking about crisis standards and they needed leeway. Um, and we proved that the employer was lying to him because as soon as the waiver process was put in place, the employers uh, canceled all of the traveler's contracts, which they didn't wanna pay for. And uh, so finally, um, that process was revoked in February. So we were successful. 
We also got uh, in California um, Cal OSHA standards on uh, banning the reuse of N95s and um, eliminated uh, the decontamination process uh, for uh, using masks because it was essentially poisoning people. And um, we just were, we're proud of those achievements, but uh, we were wondering why it was taking so long uh, to get there. And, you know, what about the rest of the states? You know, they're still having to fight that, but um, our union will continue to fight um, as we head into negotiations um, this year with uh, 70 hospitals. So um, uh, hopefully um, our employers won't have amnesia and they'll remember some of the lessons, but nurses are becoming very, very vocal now. And I think that they're afraid of that. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, it's exciting to hear about the worker organizing that's happening on so many fronts um, because all of these workers realized they really wished they had had a union when the pandemic started, right? Emily, yeah. how about for you all in, in long-term care? Have you taught your employer some lessons or are you still is that still to come? Um, I don't think they have um, learned their lessons yet. Like it's, we've come so far, like Unifor, I'm, I'm telling you, they're a force to be reckoned with because I mean, they've, we've made some noise. We've made it on every press that would possibly have us. We highlight our heroes. We highlight the struggles that we go through. We highlight the struggles that we're, we're going to go through. And, um, you know, what, it, what it's going to take um, to make change. Now, if they listen to us, or not, we're gonna to continue to make noise. And uh, for, for my workplace though, because of the emergency orders, there's not much we can fight them on because the federal government put in these emergency orders which trump our collective agreements. So we can advocate all we want for PPE. It, de it depends on when public health comes in and says, oh yes, absolutely, they need the PPE, they need, this and they need that and and that's how we got it but we made so much noise in the beginning that was falling on deaf ears and then i think unifor i i know unifor was instrumental in getting you know the word out there like hey governments pay attention like this is this pandemic's being hit hardest in long-term care what are you going to do like what are what is our act now to uh to move forward so there's campaigns, there's rallies, there's meeting outside of um, social distance uh, meetings or webinars or just media push um, petitions, anything that we can possibly use our voices or our presence or our actions. Unifor is out there uh, fighting for healthcare workers for long term care for retirement homes that was completely left out of um, pandemic pay and all that kind of um, injustices that are happening. So there is a pushback and I'm super proud of our union. I'm going to give them all the props I can possibly do because I feel like all the gains we've got in our collective workplaces is because of our union. It's because they push back and they're, they're not about to back down either. Um, without them, I don't think we would have got this far. I mean, public health comes in and they dictate the, the mandate of the what rules we follow and what rules we don't follow. So, and losing losing that um, that collective agreement to to the fact that we some of us like like small stuff like not small but like losing vacations, longer hours, uh, sick pays, you know, no paid sick days. Like, they're the employers are not listening. They're not listening. They're just like, well, it's the government, it's the ministry. We're 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 publicly funded. There's no money in the budget. There's not this. Well, this is the rules you follow it or not but as as a union activist i have used my voice on every single media platform i i could possibly that will listen to me that will listen to unifor and we're not going to stop so i'm very proud kudos to unifor keep up the good work so thanks yeah thanks we're getting close to the end of our time so i want to um just quickly uh say there's a question in the chat from margaret about um employers 
have any of them started to mandate vaccines or give incentives to give vaccine, get or get your vaccine and how did you handle it? I think we've already heard from Krista about the vaccine rollout being pretty slow in Canada. And we heard that from Antonio about it in Mexico as well. Um, I don't know if either Emily or Deborah, since you're in healthcare, if you are experiencing conversations about vaccine with your members, maybe just really briefly on this question. So for long-term care, I would say Canada's pushed to have, um, I think we have almost all of our long-term cares in Ontario vaccinated and on most of our healthcare workers, frontline workers uh, vaccinated. So that is one good thing that the provincial government does have going for them is that they're pushing and then they have the age groups. Um, I'm sorry, Krista, that you got left out of the essential worker frontline vaccinations. Um, sister, I hope you get there soon. But they have um, pushed for most long-term care is uh, almost all vaccinated. In, in the US, um, they can't um, mandate the vaccine right now because it's under emergency use authorization. But most uh, healthcare workers, when they are given the opportunity and actually have the education program that goes with that to explain the vaccine and how it works, um, are ready to take it. Um, it's a little bit unique in the US in that we had um, a previous administration that uh, didn't inspire trust because they weren't exactly honest and uh, forthcoming and providing accurate information. So there was a lot of um, misinformation. And so uh, right now, uh, the Biden administration is overcoming uh, that mistrust by providing education uh, for people to give them the confidence to get the vaccine, but by and large, when it is available, uh, people are getting the vaccine. Thanks. All right, so let's move into one kind of almost concluding sort of question and think a little bit about the future. And if you can share with us, what is a hope or maybe a worry, a concern that you have for the next six months to a year? And in, in the context of your work, either for yourselves or for your coworkers, Let's let's start with Deborah, if that's all right. We'll we'll go in sort of reverse order from how we started. Okay. So um, I I worry about everything opening too soon. Um, schools, malls, gyms, everything. Um, there's uh, we don't have everybody vaccinated yet, so there's still the possibility of a surge. In fact. Um, the CDC and Biden came out with a, a plea for people to continue wearing masks and socially distancing. And uh, right now, a lot of our states are uh, relaxing restrictions on um, uh, opening and uh, increasing the risk of exposure. Uh, we're already seeing it in states like Florida, uh, which is crazy. And then we're also concerned because of our for-profit hospital industry here in the United States um, of hospital closures. Uh, we had one hospital closure in uh, downtown LA the week that we were in shutdown when the pandemic started. We asked them to try and keep that hospital open and um, they were allowed to close um, now there's another hospital in Los Angeles that's being set to close tomorrow. And um, this hospital treated thousands of um, COVID patients and serves um, the uh, population of color in our community there. Um, so we're really looking at what seems to be a trend for closing hospitals uh, especially mom baby units and uh, labor and delivery NICU uh, at a time when we're needing hospitals even more. And even the um, CDC acknowledged that there was a lack of hospitals and they were opening up uh, MASH units in our communities because there weren't enough hospital beds. And now all of a sudden they're closing. So 
um, that is a huge concern for uh, nurses at this point because of our community. Thanks. Antonio, we'll go to you next. What are yeah. either some hopes or some worries about this coming period? Sí, claro, gracias. Bueno, ante la falta de vacunas, la esperanza y a la vez la preocupación es la conciencia del pueblo. Yo creo que mientras muchas personas sigan diciendo que no creen en el virus, mientras muchas personas sigan diciendo que no creen en la vacuna, y eso pudiera parecer quizá que es un porcentaje bajo, pero aquí en México no, sí es alto. O sea, hubo muchos contagios por, por aparte de, de que no había eh, infraestructura ni nada muchos fueron porque las personas no creen no creían hasta que se te contagió un familiar un amigo o se murieron hasta entonces empezaron a creer pero ahora muchas personas no creen en las vacunas en ninguna de ellas y, y esto va a llevar todavía a un periodo muy largo para que podamos erradicar el virus entonces por eso digo la conciencia Vemos ahorita aquí en México es un periodo de esta semana y la que viene son vacaciones eh, por un tema eh, del, del católico. Entonces la gente se va a la playa sin cubrebocas, sin la sana distancia, sin ninguna eh, medida o conciencia, que esa sí está en ti que la hagas. O sea, ahí no puede venir ningún gobierno a levantarte el cubrebocas, a obligarte con una pistola que lo uses, sino eso depende de ti. Entonces, la esperanza y la preocupación es la misma con el pueblo, ¿no? Y la, y la esperanza también es que las y los trabajadores, pues sigamos haciendo eh, la parte que nos corresponde, sobre todo como trabajadores del sector público, hasta donde sea humanamente posible por mantener los servicios al día, por este, porque sigan andando todas las oficinas públicas y sigamos también luchando por nuestras prestaciones y nuestros salarios que como ya les decía, nos han venido este, quitando en este año con el pretexto de la pandemia. El año pasado simplemente tardó dos días el gobierno en pagarle eh, su sueldo a, a los trabajadores en una quincena. Trabajadores desde policías, enfermeras, médicos y todos los trabajadores de, del sector público. Salimos a reclamar, salimos a decirle al gobernador, ya basta, y terminamos encarcelados. Y seguimos todavía un proceso judicial en nuestra cuenta por haber reclamado esa situación. Porque dice el gobernador que por qué íbamos a su empresa a reclamarle. Bueno, pues es que acá nunca vienes a trabajar. Entonces, si te la llevas en tu empresa trabajando ahí, sí, pues ahí fuimos a reclamarte, ¿no? Entonces, yo también tengo esa, esa esperanza en que las trabajadoras y trabajadores sigamos esa lucha, nos sigamos fortaleciendo a pesar de la distancia, pero considero que vamos a seguir, como decimos por acá, sacando eh, la casta, sacando el calibre cada uno para luchar y salir adelante. Thank you, Antonio. Yeah, Emily, how about you? Do you have any hopes or concerns? And we are running up against time, so we'll have to keep Sorry, it short. I'll keep it short. Um, my hope is I one day to see you all and do this face to face. Can we all agree? that I can meet Deborah and Antonio and Kirsta and Jock and you and Roxanne and, and we do this good. In, in person in, in on a beach in Virginia Beach there, Jock, we're coming. Um, that, is, that is the hope of one day getting back to normal. Oh my God, I miss people. I miss seeing their faces. I miss my family. Uh, I want to go on vacation. I want to stop working every day and doing all these long-term hours and, and, and having to be the pandemic, be the sole focus of my life. So one day, that's the hope to just end it and be in person back to normal. Um, what really scares me is that we're going to go back into another pandemic. We're going to go back with this new strain, this new variant. We're never going to, it's going to be like this carousel where you never get off. You never get off because it just keeps growing. Um, the concern is that it's gonna it's gonna affect 
my children, it's going to affect their, their anxiety, their schooling, it's going to affect um, a, the long term devastation of what this pandemic is doing is, is what's really concerning through all sectors. And I am sure that everybody could agree that everything scares us right now, everything worries us. There's, the list is too long. So um, I'll pass it back to you, Carrie, but thanks for making my fears come back up. Thanks, Emily. Thank you for sharing. Jack, how about you? You were getting in there briefly. Do you have any hopes or concerns for this coming period? Yeah, I'll keep it swift. I, I hope I hope management gets a revamp. Like uh, someone just comes in and just remix everything. I want some people, some people, some people that have been those seats that too long. They need to be go ahead and give it up. Let some new blood come in there. Uh, I hope my colleagues get compensated for the time and service that I'm, I'm out there. I see what they do. That's all essential workers all everywhere, not just for JB, just all of you, everybody. All for one, two, three, everybody. Um, as far as worries, uh, I, I think I worry time is running out. That's pretty much it. I, I feel time is, like the time is now. If it don't happen now, I don't see it changing. You know, it's now or never. Hmm. Yeah. Krista, how about you? Do you have any hopes or concerns? Um, yes. Um, my big hope is that people that, you know, maybe saw a wrong during this, they didn't see before. I know across all three of our countries, some more workers are interested in unions all of a sudden, right? I hope that continues because, you know, the layoffs out of order and all of the weird things that have happened due to the pandemic. So I hope those workers, you know, feel enfranchised and, you know, organized for better working conditions for everyone. I hope that society sees, oh, look, these are the workers that actually had to go to work. Maybe we should pay them a much more reasonable wage than, you know, these people that actually could make sourdough bread for six weeks and didn't have to go to work. <laughs> right? Like, our, our sense of what is necessary to society got really skewed. And I, think for some people, I'm hoping that they saw what it actually takes to run, you know, a country, three countries, you know, right? There's, we need sewers and we need nurses and we need personal care workers and we need all those municipal workers checking in on everyone. And that those are the workers that we need. So, you know, if they could all, all over all of our countries get, you know, pensions and benefits and, you know, living wages and free childcare, I'm going to hope for everything. I'm going to hope for everything, right? So that, that's my big hope, right? That, you know, maybe we don't go quite back to normal, Emily. Maybe we go somewhere better. That's a wonderful idea to, to leave us on, Krista. So thank you so much for concluding in that way. I thank all of you panelists for being here this that evening and for being so open with your stories. I think it's been really inspiring. We've gotten several thank yous in the Q&A there. I mean, I, I think everyone can take away from this conversation how there were so many similarities across the experiences of this pandemic. And that is part of what international solidarity helps us to both see and overcome that the problems that bosses have created for us are the same regardless of what side of an arbitrary line on a map you live on. And so I really am so appreciative of all of you making the time to have that conversation this evening and for all the participants who listened in to it as well. Thank you for being here. And thank you to our interpreters for doing such a wonderful job and keeping this conversation going so smoothly. We really appreciate your work today as well. And you are certainly essential for us being able to build these relationships across across the world. I think we're about out of time, but certainly want to remind everyone about the upcoming events for this series. Roxanne put that there in the chat for everyone to see. So if you're able to attend some of the others, we'd love that. The next one will be on April 22nd, Earth Day, and we'll be talking about the way workers have been forced to respond to crises of all kinds, including climate change. And uh, it's gonna be a great conversation. We're already getting folks lined up for that. So thank you again for everyone for being here. Merci, gracias. And I hope to see you all again soon. <laughs>